Uh, we're going to hear from one of our keynote speakers today, and I'm excited to introduce my, my friend, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Albert Bimper. Uh, Dr. Bimper, native Texan, actually played football at, at Colorado State. Um, and yeah, he actually made it to the league. Uh, he's with the Rams. I actually remember a game he played in against my school, UVA, and uh, we lost that game at home, and that brother was on the field, and he had a good time out there. He always rubs that in my face. But uh, Dr. Bimper actually went to the league, played with uh, Peyton Manning, Tony Dungy, and the Colts, and actually won a Super Bowl. The only brother I know personally with a Super Bowl ring, and I think he's got it on the day. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, went on to get an MS in sports psychology from Purdue, and then he actually came back home to Texas, where he linked up with Dr. Harrison and, and, and knocked out a PhD program and a wonderful dissertation. And he's been doing great work ever since. Went to Kansas State, and uh, some issues arose at Colorado State, and they said, brother, you need to come home and, and, and come fix this. So Dr. Bimper actually created a position. Uh, in the athletic department, senior associate athletic director for diversity, but he's also a tenure track professor in ethnic studies. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Albert Bimper. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, you knocked out kind of all my introductions, so I guess I'm going to make my time limit. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of background. I grew up in the DFW area, so I went to school at uh, Arlington Bowie High School. Um, playing football was everything that I knew. Uh, unfortunately, I played for a horrible team. So in high school, I only won two football games. Uh, and that was my senior year, so I went 0-10, 0-10, 0-10. And y'all know Texas football. Sitting at the barbershop when I had hair, was, it was brutal. They just made jokes and throw shade, and I was like, this ain't cool. Uh, <laughs> So I said, I'm not cutting my hair no more. I'm just going to grow it up. I had a fro. Um, but in high school, um, the opportunity to, to go to college, I, did, I didn't know if it was for me. Uh, my father's from Ghana, and, and, and he always spoke to me about, you need to go to school, you need to go to school. But my high school wasn't really built. It, it, the focus wasn't necessarily to send us to college. It was really to get us through high school. So as much as it, as it was a dream, I never saw it as a reality as much. So the opportunity to go to, um, to college came through football, and I had some schools that did come recruit me in, in, in Colorado State. As we talked about study abroad, I, I saw Colorado as my study abroad. I'd never been out of the state of Texas. I was like, I'm about to go study abroad. <laughs> I saw mountains and snow it had accum that accumulated. I said, oh, this is going to be good. I'm going to be all kinds of culturally aware now. <laughs> but... Uh, Colorado was, it was different for me, and I, I wanted that exposure. So um, I went out there, um, redshirted my first year, and all the ills that come with redshirting, thinking you should be on the field, and you're better than everyone, and all that. And you know that kind of depression sets in. I also had never had a two-a-day practice. I did spring ball, but I didn't have two-a-days. That's probably why we were bad in high school. I called my mother. I said, Mom, the, the coach practices twice in one day. You better come get me. <laughs> this coach is nuts. But I eventually did get on the field. Um, played four years for the, for the Rams. Um, my first game in college was against UVA. Um, and we went out there. We think we were the first, uh, I'm going to tell the story, Darren. We were the first school to, uh, uh, first game of that college season. It was a kickoff game. We went to UVA and, and we got to play on like a Thursday night or something. And so we beat uh, the Cavaliers. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. We did make them cry, didn't we? Sorry. It's all right. Men can cry. Um, so after, so after uh, CSU, um, I didn't know if I was going to have a shot at the league. I actually uh, popped my hamstring my senior year, missed about half my season my senior year. And so the opportunity for what I thought was going to be the league, and uh, you know, for me, going to college was my big dream. You know? And the NFL was like icing on the, you know, on the cake. But all of a sudden, your senior year, you start to see some, uh, some opportunity there. And then my hamstring pops in a, in a game and I missed the, most of my season. So that didn't seem like it was going to come to fruition. But it did, and I was an undrafted free agent, so I didn't walk in there with the big dollars. Um, I walked in there, I say I made the NFL the hard way. Right? We walk, there was about 26 or so uh, recruits, or 26 uh, or so uh, rookies, and they cut most of us. They even cut, I think, one of their draft picks that year. I mean, money they had invested in I, I saw the business side of the NFL. The NFL, uh, let's be real, was a, I call it a cup of coffee in the league. 
I wasn't there very long. Um, but it was a good cup of coffee, you know, they dropped some cream in there, a little Super Bowl ring. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was nice, and, 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 and I appreciate even the time that I had there, to appreciate the leadership that I was a part of, uh, that I got to see uh, with Tony Dungy at the helm, uh, the other players and how they carried themselves, and Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison and Reg Reggie Wayne and Dwight Freeney. I was blessed to be a part of that team that year. And so I wanted to soak up as much opportunity. And then all of a sudden, when that day ended for me in football, I, I went to Purdue right up the road, and they had a gra uh, became a graduate assistant. I was at Purdue, and I'm there, and I think I have, uh, I mean, I have my, my degree from college. I'm, I'm pursuing now a master's degree. I have a Super Bowl ring, and I feel like a failure because everybody sees me as the athlete. And I'm not that anymore. I'm a coach. But I'm around a lot of athletes, and they're like, why are you here? You should be in the league. You should be making that money. And that just wasn't my life anymore. So those two years or so at Purdue were hard for me, but I was on track to, you know, I felt like I was trying to do something for my, with my life, but it was hard. I came to the University of Texas uh, doing work because what really resonated with me was identity, and, and I was trying to reshape mine. And so I came to the University of Texas, reached out to Dr. Harrison, um, and, and his work around athletic identity and racial identity and so forth. And I said, Doc, I'd re really love to come work with you. When I came on my visit, I got to meet, you know, the legendary Dr. Moore, too. He picked me up in that van. You remember that van? Minivan. Yeah, the minivan. <laughs> he said, you really want to come here? You can be driving a minivan. I said, no. Nah. <laughs> I, I did, though. Because as it was said yesterday, I had never really seen men, black men, men of color, in the positions that these men are in at, at this institution. Um, I, never, I didn't get to touch them, I didn't get to feel them, I didn't get to spend time with them. When I was an undergraduate student at Colorado State, our president was African American, it was Albert C. Yates. And to see him from a distance was inspiring, but to be able to touch these men was, was something different, and I wanted to be that. So this was my awakening. As much as the league was great, coming to, coming to Texas and getting my PhD was something, it was the most powerful moment for me. And it got me thinking, and I got to do the work around race and, uh, and sport and, and black athletes, and it's really led me down this career, as uh, Darren really uh, uh, spelled out. So I want to spend some time, that's a little bit of my background, I want to spend some time on this quote. This is a quote by my president at Colorado State, Dr. Anthony Frank, Tony Frank. Um, and he speaks to our vision. Our vision stands against a stormy backdrop. This is interesting to me. He's, he uses this quote as he talks to uh, many of our donors and, and he talks to uh, our alumni. And he's talking about the future of education. He's talking about the future of our institution. And I, it stood out to me because I think it applies to the future of college athletics. I think it applies to what we're trying to do here with this conference. There's a stormy backdrop that we have to be aware of. When I look at this uh, quote, one word comes to mind. Vigilance. Do you see it? It's telling us to be vigilant. Vigilance comes from a, a, a mid-16th century uh, French. That's his etymology, and, and it, it, it asks us to be watchful. It asks us to be uh, awake, to become awakened. Awake. That's kind of an interesting word to me, too, because I wonder if our leadership at our institutions, I wonder if our athletic directors, I wonder if our academic directors, and, and so forth, those that care and, and, and for the welfare of our student athletes, and many of which do so with, with great intentions, are they operating with this idea of being vigilant? Are they awake to the issues? Are they awake to the backdrop on which we work right now? I was paired with the HBCU uh, conversation, so I figured I'd make a little bit of a connection. This is Colorado State when it, uh, uh, at, at our uh, uh, formative years in the 1870s, an ag school, Colorado A&M. When you see pictures like this, these old pictures, when you think about the 1870s, what comes to your mind? Go ahead, shout it out. Lynching? Civil rights? Civil War, Reconstruction. These are all true. The 1870s were a time that I would say uh, represented some of our you know, most overt racism, 
It was that time period, sexism and so forth. When I look at, these pic when I look at this picture, I also see a, a great experiment happening right there. One of the greatest experiments that I would say is a part of our country is the experiment of, of, of sovereignty and the experiment of self-governance, the experiment of democracy. And less than 100 years, with a less uh, acknowledged and a less remarkable, I guess, experiments that we don't give as much credit to might be the experiment of public education. Public education happening as Colorado State is a land-grant institution. Now, land grants happened in 1862, and, and, and the Morrill Act II of 1890 creates our HBCUs. But the land grant philosophy and the idea of access and opportunity, there was a backdrop happening right there that there was a great experiment that someone took, sh that, that took shape and created public education and access and opportunity for many of you that, that sit in this room that now have an education to change your family's lives and the trajectory of your families and so, and so forth. There was an interesting backdrop. This is 2015 in Colorado State. This year, these are my students. At the beginning of this year, I spoke uh, to our incoming freshman class, uh, around 6,000 of them uh, that come and they parade into our uh, basketball arena. This was an interesting, so the, our vice president of student affairs said, hey, Doc, uh, love for you to, you know, come talk to our students. And she always asked me that, so I figured I was coming to talk to a class of like 15 people. I walked into a basketball arena, 6,000. I said, you, you didn't mean like talk to the class. <laughs> but the backdrop of the 1870s in the, in, in the formative years of my institution at Colorado A&M, now Colorado State, looks much different. The faces look different. The opportunities look different in many ways. Right after this, this is a, the We Are CSU speech. This is uh, something that we're doing, and this is reflective of the culture that we're trying to bring in our campus. Of When they first arrive on campus, we're having conversations about community. What does it mean to be a Colorado State Ram? What does social justice and equity look like if you're going to be a freshman here? How do you take care of each other? And that was the emphasis of, of, of that talk. And right after that, they go, and take, they go onto the field, and they create this huge class picture. And we've done this for the last few years. I think this is one of the most amazing things to get them all organized to do so. The key is to feed them afterwards. <laughs> but they take this picture, and, and I look at this, and I, it reminds me of a few years ago when I went to CSU, when I, when I left the DFW area, when I left Arlington and went to CSU. Uh, it, it still kind of looks the same in a general sense. A lot of white faces. Colorado State's 32,000 students, 27 and a half thousand of them, uh, 27 and a half uh, are resident students, 4% of our population, including graduate students and undergrads, 4% is black. Less than 1% is our student athletes, black. So it's interesting that the backdrop is this, a predominantly white institution by numbers and historically white by thinking. It's still there and we still deal with that and that's still our backdrop. So when they asked me to come to CSU and they said, Doc, you know, uh, as, as, as Darren alluded, we, we had a, 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 a group of former alumni uh, come to our institution. I'll be real, right? <laughs> a group of alumni come to our institution on a, on a spring football game with a coach or so ago and an AD or so ago. And the question was asked, what are you doing for black athletes? This is by alumni that I hadn't seen, I, many of them I didn't know. They played years before me. I was like, wow, why didn't y'all come back when I was playing? <laughs> but they asked the question. That literally was the first question of the night. What are you doing for black athletes? And the response was, I hadn't thought about it. They weren't vigilant. Our leadership, we look for a lot of great words of like excellence and integrity, accountability. They, they post them across our weight rooms, and, and, and they're powerful. They, 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 they evoke a lot of emotion for us. But how often, as, as Dr. Moore asked, are we afraid or are we scared? I would ask, do we ask for our leadership to, to beyond, beyond excellence, do we ask for our leadership to value vigilance? Are you aware of what's going on in the world? Are you aware of, of the challenges that we face right now? Or is it really just about the money? Because I get that. 
But trust me, I'm not coming to CSU because it's not going to be just my responsibility to, to lead the efforts of diversity and inclusion. It won't be and it can't be. We will fail at this. I would love to come to CSU. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to that conversation. Y'all hear that? All right. So I'm having that conversation with those that I'm meeting with on our campus and, and those that are new faces in my athletic department. They weren't the same coaches that, I, that coached me. They weren't the same leadership that led me. It, it wasn't the same president that I had of the university. And I said, I'd love to come back to CSU and serve in the place that created so much opportunity and access for me. But I can't do it alone. It's not just my responsibility. It's yours. If you're the president, it's on your head around diversity and inclusion. Missouri reminded us of that. If you're the AD, it's on your head, diversity and inclusion. It's not just mine. Now, this is a little bit more than the we're all responsible. This is, it's a part of your job description. It's, it's on the first line now. This is your responsibility to be aware, to be vigilant, and to be awake about what's going on in our world. We signed on, and I said, I'll, if you're going to sit in the boat with me, then I'll do this. Last year, we won the uh, NCAA Diversity Award, um, which I think is a very prestigious award offered by the NCAA and MOA uh, Opportunities Athletic Fund Association. I want to say congratulations to uh, um, uh, Frazier at, at, at uh, uh, Northern Illinois. They'll be receiving this award this year uh, uh, in a few days. But this was important. They asked who should, be, who should receive the award. I would come up here and receive the award, come to the NCAA convention, that's great. Um, and I said, I, well, I, our leadership has to be there because it's not on me, it's on them still. I'm in the, I'm in the boat with them, and, I, and, and I'll roll and I'll fight with them. But this happens because it's a top-down approach in many ways. I need them to commit to it. I need them to not only create a position that can speak to it on, on high levels and work with resources across our campus and work with our vice presidents across our campus, work with faculty across our campus. I, I need that, but I need them to put me in position. I need them to create a budget line. I need money to do this work. That's their leadership. That's that top down that I needed. That's what I needed them to sign up to because that's what I wanted them to commit to and say it's on them. Here's our backdrop. At the top here, there's some uh, basketball players that graduated from CSU last year. It's the media. It's our history of social justice. It's our history of risk. It's the big schools that carry just the name Alabama. That makes some kids' eyes go big, and parents, they forget why they want to send their kids to college. It's just, I just want to go play. Do they ask questions on their recruiting trips? I wish I could stand here, and as the world, I've been in this world, and some could probably uh, uh, vouch for me, that I wish I could say that parents do come, and they ask on their recruiting trips, what are you going to do for my kids, and what are you going to do? Sometimes they don't ask. And, and some, some know and, and, and don't want to ask, but they're kind of caught up, too, just like their students in all the fanfare that we create on a recruiting trip. I wish I could say that every parent comes there and, and, and they don't care about any of the facilities. They don't care about anything. They want to know about what classes their kids, they, they don't always ask that. And so are we vigilant at the leadership of our institution? Are we going to step in there and say, this is what we do. This is what we offer. This is what we're up against. I'm recruiting athletes that come from this culture. I'm recruiting athletes that come from this backdrop. I'm recruiting athletes that come from this backdrop. They're straight out of everywhere. We even appropriate the straight out of somewhere, uh, uh, straight out of South Lake Carroll. I was thinking, South Lake Carroll? <laughs> I, that's true. That's a real thing. I, I went to our recruiting office, and, and she was creating pictures of straight out of South. I was like, really? That's, that's how we're going to get them? <laughs> But we got to think about who our students are, the Generation Y, these millennials. They come with a different package. Defunding of education, the cost of attendance, the prison pipeline, these urban cities, or the students that come from the rural cities and go to these urban cities. Right? It's a change. The Rick Ross effect. I was telling Adrian, I was looking up Rick, Rick Ross last night. I was like, this is about to go south. 
the blackish family. Some of my students come from families that they're not all black. I, I, my, my mother's white, an interracial family. And so coming to college, I'm really negotiating what blackness looks like. Some come with this idea of, of, of a thug mentality, and that's part of their blackness identity, maybe. Some have no idea about that. And their, their black identity is a, is a, is a, is a great, is, you know, is this, uh, a father that's a lawyer and a mother that's this. Right? That's their blackness. And then they come and they, they're mixed with other students that have different backgrounds, and it becomes very blackish. Right? Black isn't monolithic for our black student athletes, and, and we have to really think about the programming we put in place, how we account for all these variables. Complex, I know. I figured this was the bird we learned about yesterday. The work we're trying to do at CSU is really reflective of this principle. Here's a picture of 1940s, the CSU football team. First black football player, John Mosley. Second row down, third from the, I guess your left. John Mosley played at CSU in a time that I would call well our remarkable black athletes. That's our foundation, as, as Harrison would teach in, in the African American sport class. That's our foundation, remarkable black athletes, the, the Paul Robesons and so forth. These folks that, that went to schools that they weren't very welcoming. John Mosley went to CSU, and, and they didn't just carve a path for him and say, this is going to be great. You got it. But he was remarkable. He was a valedictorian at Emanuel High School in, in Denver. He came to CSU in the 1940s and, and became a vice president and treasurer of his junior and senior class, student body, engaged on campus. After playing for CSU, he went and served for, for a greater team. He joined the Tuskegee Airmen. He passed away just last year, around May. Before he passed, we, we, we honor him with a, a program we call the John Mosley Leadership Program. This is where we serve our student athletes of color, primarily black student athletes. Every other Sunday throughout the year, we feed them. And we come through and we have the dialogue. We, ha we have the, uh, 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 the opportunity to, to, uh, to speak on the issues that are relevant in the present and in the past. We focus on four areas around mentorship, self-exploration, community. We call it transitional growth and leadership. I want to highlight this picture here. This past year, we did something different, trying to put the student first. Um, we did a declare your major day. So it was one of the biggest moments in my life was signing that scholarship in my high, my high school library with the cameras and stuff around me. And, and that was what I walked into college with. So that's what everybody else saw me. That's what I was going there for. And that was on my, that was on my heart. People saw me as the athlete. And so we have to celebrate the same moment in the same big way when our athletes make decisions around their academic commitments. So we sit there and we sign them to different colleges when they go through a process of having conversation with our career center. Throughout the year, you can't get to this day unless you've had that conversation. And then publicly, because identity is both how I see myself and how you see me, I want the world to see our athletes doing academic things, so they do assign their, uh, declare their major day. <laughs> Mentorship is about, we have these circles of mentoring. There are peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. We call, in the John Mosley program, uh, the student athletes in that program are our red tails. Tuskegee. The peer, the peer mentors are our co-pilots, those that have been through the program and those that can speak to a peer-to-peer -peer conversation and dialogue. And then we bring in former athletes that have played at CSU or that now have moved to the area and we're a part of the community, so we're reaching out. We find out that you played sport. We need you. You're a former athlete. You become one of our navigators. And so these circles of mentoring, and we put them through, and it's about building relationships and resources. Self-exploration is about the identity. Who am I? Where do I come from? What does my blackness mean? What does my being an athlete mean? What does it mean to be at a historically white college? And so forth. We have that conversation, and, and we let, allow them to guide many of the conversations. Sometimes we put the topic out there. We want them to guide it in many ways. I know my time's getting close. Community 
It's about community service, but in, in many ways, less of the community service because we, we knocked that out pretty much. And, and I'm getting a little tired of, of, of parading the athletes around some of the hospitals in their, in their garb and saying, you know, and they do the hug and the handshake and all that. It's good. I get that. But I don't know what our athletes selfishly get out of that experience sometimes. So some of it is about how do I build community? How do I get our athletes to participate and engage community and talk about the issues that are happening in the Denver, in the Denver uh, 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 um, area, in the northern Colorado area? Do you know that, that we have one of the lowest uh, uh, um, graduation areas or, or, or uh, impoverished areas just north of this university in your own town of Fort Collins? Well, it needs you to engage and be a part of the community engage, and so it becomes a lot of project-based activity. And then transitional growth, thinking about the transition. That's transition from first semester to second semester of school. That's transition from high school to college. That's transition from, from the in season to the off season. That's transition from your best professor ever to your worst professor ever. That's transition between your coach just got the opportunity to leave and you wanted to leave, but you don't get that. So now we need to still work on your new transition of a new coach. I get that. So it's talking about all the transitions and all the context that take place and how you grow through that. We have a product of that. A.J. Newton, stand up. AJ's, AJ's a transition, she came to me and said, Doc, I just want to be a woman in charge. I said, wow, that's a, that's a big transition. I don't know how we, where we, but we worked on it, right? And now she's here at the University of Texas getting her master's degree in, in higher education leadership. This is what we're working on. I think, the, I think the vision is simple, one step at a time, pursue excellence. That's simple language. Be vigilant, be awake. That's simple language that I get that. But it's very steep, and if we recognize the backdrop, then we know that we have a lot of work to, uh, that needs to take place, and we need to own that. Our leadership needs to own that. Our presidents need to own that. Our ADs need to own that. Albert Bemper needs to own that. Think about learning and how students learn. We got to ask new questions. Do it differently. I think the, I'll, I'll put a plug in, I think some of the most creative ways are these study abroad, and it's our programming that's like our classrooms that are flipping the classrooms. Let's flip the programming. Let's make them look more project-based, engaged, and let them be creative in what they create through these programs versus us always just bringing in the speakers. I think that's my time, so thank you. <laughs>